Hiya folks, I got a question in response to an article I put up on my blog yesterday, I think it was yesterday, uh, called uh, How Do Good Spiritual Teachers Go Bad? And it was based on a transcript of a video I put up on here in 2018 with the same title, and if I can find them I'll put links below. <laughs> if I can't find them I won't put the links. But this prompted a question. And since before your sun burned hot in the sky and before your race was born, I have awaited a question. The question comes from a friend of mine. Well, I, I, okay, I'll say she's a friend of mine. I haven't seen her since maybe 1982 or so. Uh, she was a person in Wadsworth, Ohio. Uh, back when I was in Wadsworth, Ohio, we were both students in Wadsworth High School. She gave me my first big break in the rock and roll business by, uh, she had a party and she hired, well, we didn't get paid, but she, she asked my band, Max, uh, my punk rock band, first punk rock band I ever had, to come and play at that party. And it was one of, I think, four or five gigs that the band did. So that was neat. She got into Buddhism in another form of Buddhism uh, later on, as did I. Maybe we got into it at the same time. I don't really know the story. She got into a Tibetan style of Buddhism, and her name is Cindy Choi. And I got this question. She supports me on Patreon, and I got this question on Patreon, which I'd like to answer here sort of publicly because I think it's an interesting question. So here, here goes the question. I submit that there is a third category of teacher after your first two, and that is the enlightened master. That's the only kind of teacher I would ever take teachings from. You would classify my teacher, Sogyal Rinpoche, as one of the ones who crashed and burned. That's true in a literal sense because we just completed months of practice culminating in his cremation, lol. So he actually literally burned. I completely understand how outside observers would see my teacher as going bad. And if you want to look up Sogyal Rinpoche, I talked about him in one of my videos before, but uh, there's a lot of stuff around this guy. That is a completely valid, logical, rational conclusion. I have some questions for you, Brad. 1. Do you believe the Buddha attained enlightenment? 2. What do you think enlightenment is slash means? 3. Do you think your teacher who ordained you was an enlightened master? 4. Do you think enlightened human beings, maybe not on the level of the Buddha, but let's say one hell of a lot closer to Buddha than us, are alive today? And these are interesting questions, and I've kind of done variations on these questions before, but I want to take them one by one and see where I get with them on this YouTube video. Okay, so question number one. Do you believe the Buddha at attained enlightenment? Gosh, that, that's a hard question because I wasn't there, obviously, and I don't know the Buddha, but I would have to say yes. Um, however, I would like to kind of qualify my yes because the way the Buddha's enlightenment is usually presented is that he went off on this journey to find the answer, the truth of the universe, and he did a bunch of things that are usually sort of um, explained in the literature as as if they're the, the wrong things to do. But I don't know if they were exactly the wrong things to do. They were just part of his actual personal journey. But they didn't lead to the enlightenment that he sought, the, the, the answer that he sought. So he did that for oh, six years, I think. Uh, and then he did this thing where he just sat down on a rock under a tree and meditated for 40 days, I believe the tradition is. I, I always get a little fuzzy on this, so people can feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. And at the culmination of this, he was sitting early in the morning, and he saw the morning star, Venus, I assume, and... Upon seeing that, he had a great revelation that completely changed his life. And from that point on, we call him the Buddha, or Buddha, uh, if you want to be. Somebody was chastising me about pronouncing it wrong, but I do have a friend, uh, an Indian friend, like India Indian friend, who pronounces it that way. And I'm familiar with it, but I just say Buddha. Whatever. So he became the Buddha. Buddha means enlightened one. So... 
we give him a different name from the point that this happened onward in his life. So before that, he's Siddhartha or Gotama, and after that, he is Buddha uh, or Tathagata, which is what he called himself after that incident, which means uh, the one who has come thus. It's a very strange name. So I believe that really happened, and I believe that was significant. I don't know if I believe the idea that that he changed from one being to another being. Uh, that that is that's usually the way it's sort of presented, but I am not so sure that happens. And maybe getting into the other questions, I'll try to clarify that. Question number two: What do you think enlightenment is slash means? Okay. So, uh, I don't know what it means. There is a word that is often used in the Soto tradition that Dogen was not fond of, and it's Kensho. And I just came across a passage where he, he um, says the Platform Sutra is no good, it's a fake sutra, because it uses this word kensho. And kensho means seeing nature. And it is uh, the idea is that you see into the true nature of things. And Dogen uh, was not fond of this term kensho. And as far as I know, I don't think he ever used or rarely used the other term uh, satori, which is more common because D.T. Suzuki used it. It's more common for English speakers to be familiar with the word satori than kensho. But they are both kind of variations on the same thing. Satori means to satoru in uh, in Japanese and just standard conversational Japanese means to um, realize something. So it's a kind of a common word, but when you tend when you turn it into a noun, satori, it has this kind of highfalutin, you know, Buddhisty meaning of of having a, a complete experience of full on awakening. I believe the experience of Satori uh, Kensho exists because, as some of you who are familiar with my writings will know, something like that happened to me. I don't like to use those words for it, but it's the so-called bridge experience that that I've talked about. And I think a lot of people misunderstand because there's always... Uh, there's always somebody who comments angrily when I mention this experience as if I'm trying to kind of put it out there as a badge of authority that this this thing happened to me. I don't think it's a badge of authority. I think it's something that doesn't happen to everybody. And I think the version I had was significant, but of course I would think that, wouldn't I? Because it was the version that happened to me. But I, I do think it was significant. It was a moment, and I keep trying to describe it in different ways, but it was a moment in which, quite literally, I was seeing through different eyes, and the eyes that I was seeing through were the eyes of the universe, of everything. Which, you know, that sounds like a grand claim that somebody would, you know, want to spiral a career off of, and maybe I have, but not really. Um... Most people who who make this claim of having had this experience, well, let's not say most people, a lot of people who make the claim of having experience like this do use it as a kind of authority, like, well, I've seen the grand truth, uh, and you haven't, and therefore come unto me and listen to me, and I'll tell you the way. Uh, my take on it is the experience is very much related to my Zazen practice, and in a sense, I can place it in a time, you know, I can place it in a, a specific time frame and I can say it happened to me and, you know, I can explain it that way. But in another sense, it was outside of time and it was outside of me. So it was a bit like having the experience of, of no longer being Brad, uh, but also very, very fundamentally being exactly Brad. Uh, so it was a weird, weird experience in, in a lot of ways, but the other thing about it was that it was very normal. I've had other sort of 
unusual experiences, sort of spooky experiences around meditation that that afterwards made me go like, whoa, what the hell was that? You know, like sort of coming down off an acid trip or a high or something or, you know, kind of um, uh, knock you for a loop and make you confused. This was not confusing at all. In fact, I continued on like I told the story many times. I was on my way to work and I walked to work and I did my day's work for the day. Um, and and I think Mickey, who was my closest friend at Subaraya, might have noticed something was odd about me that day. But I don't think anybody else at the office uh, who I interacted with that day uh, noticed anything. I, I think I probably just seemed, you know, I always seemed odd to them anyway, but I probably just seemed just the normal level of, of weird. But I wasn't like shell shocked or anything. It was just like, I don't know. But in a sense, that that experience is now, at, at this moment, being translated by by this, by this guy in the alien beanie. I, I bought this online. It was one of these things where you're, you know, it's dangerous to be able to buy things any time of day or night. And it's something I saw on like Instagram or something. I'm like, oh God, I got to have that. And I ordered it. And then a week later it shows up and I'm like, oh God, I ordered that. Anyway, that's who this experience is forced to come through. There's, there's no other way for the experience to communicate itself except through the human beings who have it. And, and I imagine that this, that this experience or something very like it happens to non-human beings as well. It might happen occasionally to animals or, or to, to things like that, and I don't know what they do with it. You know, and I would imagine if there are creatures looking like this on other planets that this experience is common to them as well and maybe they have their own way of communicating it to each other i don't know and i wouldn't know if that would be compatible with our way of communicating it or not suffice it to say it's got to squeeze through this and so t taking from there extrapolating from there the experience also had to squeeze itself through gotama siddhartha and I get the impression that Gotama Siddhartha was probably a better vehicle for this experience to be squeezed through than I am. Uh, so, in, in a sense, his enlightenment is purer, you know, and maybe therefore can be called enlightenment. I don't want to call what happened to me enlightenment because, you know... I, I, who would believe that anyway? I certainly wouldn't believe it if I heard me say that and I wasn't me. So I don't call it that. But I think there is this experience and I think it is the the ground of all being and non-being is what my first teacher, Tim McCarthy, used to like to call it. And I, I think this ground of all being and non-being can sometimes squeeze itself through a person and then the person can try to communicate that to others. And I think that's what happened with our friend Gotama. Long answer to a short question. Let's see what question number three was. Do you think your teacher who ordained you was an enlightened master? Well, given the criteria that I just explained for enlightenment, Kensho, Satori, whatever, yes. I, I would say definitely Nishijima Roshi had touched that experience as well, and yes, definitely Tim McCarthy had touched that experience too, uh, and I would say based on what I hear from them, that Koto Sawaki and uh, Niwa Rempo, who were Nishijima Roshi's main teachers, had probably the experience squeezed through them, and and uh, probably uh, Tim's teacher, Cobancino, also squeezed through him. I think also in those cases that Nishijima Roshi was a better vessel for communicating this. Tim McCarthy is certainly better vessel for communicating this than me. Cobancino, much, much better. Go get his book. Uh, it's, um, I'll leave a link if I, or, or put it, I'll put a, a thing down on the bottom of the screen if I can remember the title, because I, I have a hard time remembering these things off the top of my head. But, um, 
but they they were p- people who it it squeezed through and 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 it came out better uh, than it comes through me. So yes, I would say yes, an enlightened master. Uh, do you think enlightened human beings, maybe not on the level of the Buddha, but let's say one hell of a lot closer to the Buddha than us, are alive today? Again, yes. Uh, yes, if you're going to put it in those terms, I would say they do exist and and we can meet them. And I think some of these people who this experience squeezes itself through may have issues and problems like all human beings do. And because of that, they may end up doing things that are not right. You know, I I, I have the feeling from talking to some of Joshu Sasaki's students and reading the words of Joshu Sasaki that, that he was a genuine master, if we want to put it, enlightened master, if we want to put it in the terms that this question is put into. But uh, he obviously had some issues, and uh, not everything he did worked out right, and a lot of people were upset and hurt by what he did. Same with Sogyal Rinpoche. I don't know enough to to say whether I would I would you know count him among them, but probably. I mean, maybe it it it, it very well could be. A lot of people seem to really resonate with the things Sogyal Rinpoche said. So perhaps in spite of the scandals and stuff, he also did that. He also had the experience squozen through him. And yet he's kind of left being the same person that he was before. And that has its own repercussions and that has its own karma. So I think this this idea of an enlightened master is is um is a term we have to be careful with because i don't think that this experience confers perfection upon a person it gives a person a glimpse of the totality of this universe we're living in and will certainly let you know that the way you have been conceiving of the universe you are living in is not correct. So that that's one of the things that, that happened for me, was the very deep understanding that my way of conceiving things and my way of perceiving things is not correct. And when I say my way of perceiving things, I'm talking about on the on the most basic level, like the, the fact that I perceive this as an iPhone with a pink dinosaur on the back and, you know, it's, I don't know, six inches long or whatever it is and, and you know, and feels like this. I would say that is that even that is a mistake that is a mistaken perception what this is is some is something else you know and i took a picture of myself oh wow um anyway uh that's uh, so that's enlightenment (laughs) sorry special effects and everything on this channel you you're getting it all today so that is uh that's what i think is that it uh, our, our perceptions are wrong and that that sometimes some of us, if we work at it, can get to a position of momentarily seeing things more like they are. But when you're when you kind of come out of that situation, I don't even want to say a state or something, you're you're back. You're back here again, perceiving things the way you perceived them before. And you can still make tremendous mistakes and and it it doesn't it doesn't absolve you it doesn't remove from you the ability to make tremendous mistakes this is why i think the buddha was so clear on his teachings of ethics and dogen was very clear on his teaching of ethics and all down the line of the soto tradition ethics are really drummed into everybody who gets into it. I, I am sure the same thing happens in the tr- Tibetan tradition too, uh, that, they, that they drill the ethical stuff into you. Uh, uh, but um, you still have the, the choice 
of of to ignore that you know which gets into this whole thing about whether there's freedom of choice or not nishijima roshi's answer to the question of whether there's freedom of choice is if you look at things in sort of the terms of linear time you can't say there's freedom of choice your past determines your present your present determines your future and everything is is fixed but there's this other thing that happens which is the present moment this moment in this moment you have the ability to do what you can do in this moment and there is a certain amount of choice available i cannot choose to have a fart so tremendous that it will lift me into the air because that's not my karma but i can choose to snap my fingers or poke my own nose or or whatever i can i can make those sorts of choices within the limitations of what i have which means you can do bad things if you want to and you're gonna endure the consequences of those bad actions there you go that was a long ass video i hope you enjoyed it and if you enjoyed it and if you made it all the way through congratulations you can donate to me via paypal and patreon the links are below and that is how i make my living as i often say and i really appreciate your support and that's that's that and we'll see you next time sorry this was so long